This lecture will introduce you to Chinese art, looking at the following dynasties. The Qin and Hun Dynasty, Northern Wei Dynasty, Song Dynasty, Yuan Dynasty, and the Ming Dynasty. We know very little about China because it has only been excavated since the 1920s. The history is also being repeatedly rewritten. The civilization is very distinct with advances in ceramics, metalwork, jade, potter's wheel, reduction firing, and high fired stoneware slash porcelain. All of these will be prized and traded along the Silk Road and making its way to the West. The history of China is immense, representing about 8,000 years of civilization. It is on a land mass larger than the continental U.S. and represents one-fifth of the world population. The area is divided into different regions by three rivers and a mountain range. The southern region has greater rainfall, which is appropriate for agriculture. It also has fertile plains, a coastline with rich harbors and port cities, as well as a maritime trading network. In the north, where you have the Yellow River, the land is drier, it is hot during the summer, and very cold and rigid during the winter. With the evolution in history of Chinese art, we have number one, the category of mythocentric, the belief in close relationship between human and supernatural worlds. Number two, the religious images connect with human actions, where you have Confucianism and Buddhism being dominant. Then finally, number three, the philosophical slash aesthetic where you have the avoidance of human conditions because the ideals are seen through symbolism. Chinese history is divided into periods called dynasties. They are ruled by a king or emperor who comes from a continuous ruling family. The main way for a dynasty to come to an end is for the emperor to be overthrown after a rebellion or war. During the Qin Dynasty, Emperor Shihangdi brought an end to more than two centuries of political and social turmoil by conquering all rival states and uniting an area equal to about half of present-day China into an empire he ruled. He began his mausoleum, which shows how confident he was. He sought out immortality by way of his mausoleum and funerary pra building practices. One of the greatest archaeological discoveries ever made anywhere in the world came to light in 1974 when farmers digging a well in a village near Lintong in Shaanxi province discovered some broken terracotta statues. It's a vast pottery army which is slowly being unearthed from the tomb where it's lain for more than 2,000 years. At one time when a Chinese... I worked in this site for many years, uh, for um, decades. <laughs> yeah. So these warriors are all life-sized, like real soldiers. Also, they have a different facial features. You can tell from their hairstyle, their, their what we call headgears, and they can tell their different ranks. The Tarakata warriors was found accidentally. One day, a group of farmers 
digging well here, and they find some pieces of the pottery. They also find the head of the terracotta warriors, and they, the team, archaeological team, came to this area and they start to uh, dig. Originally in um, ancient China, like 3,000 years ago, they believed the afterlife. When the elites died, like king or um, noble uh, people, they died, and they normally buried their uh, servants with them. So the human sacrifice, and uh, people start criticize the human sacrifice. So they um, think, probably use the target figures as a substitute. When we discovered in pit three, very surprisingly, we find well-preserved colors. When we lift one target worry, target bodies, so the very bright colors stick on the soil, very bright, bright uh, red and pink, blue, green. The other colors are natural, like natural, uh, um, probably mineral, or uh, come from some plants. But the purple is chemical from from chemical reaction, so that kind of uh, artificial. So these kind of uh, you know chemical reaction, so only find in China. That's really revolutionary, you know that kind of technology in 2000 years ago in Qin time. That was really fascinating part of my archaeological career. <laughs>100 life-size ceramic horses, along with men, all in military formation facing east with weapons. Facing east is significant because the sun rises in the east, thus we have the promise of resurrection and renewal. The tomb mound was left alone as to not disturb the find. Here's just an image from the 1998 movie Mulan. The soldiers are all different and individualized. All details on the clothing and facial features were carefully observed. Next, we have the Han Dynasty, which represents a period of peace, prosperity, and stability. Great economic prosperity can be found in this period because of the exchange of ideas. The Han Dynasty represents an end of the methocentric age, which was the belief in a close relationship between humans and the supernatural world. Here's a sample of the worldview of the Chinese at this time, where you have the heaven, earth, and the underworld. The universe is divided. The heaven is at the top, then you have the earth below, and the underworld below it. The greatest section is given to heaven itself. The torch dragon, which is the primordial deity, is represented as a man with a serpent's tail. Not just anyone can make it to heaven. They must pass through the gates of protection. 
The deceased is accompanied by three attendants who are kneeling attendants that welcome him into heaven. Several of the objects seen here, like the bronze bells, the ritual vessels, food and wine, were often found in burials that were part of ritual offerings. Below you see a muscular man who holds up a platform on a pair of fish. Now let's discuss Taoism slash Taoism. The Tao, the way or path, is a central component. For one to recover, one must unlearn and practice the Wu Wei of non-doing, or strive for non-striving. It can be understood as you attempting to go against the flow of the universe. One attempts to assert ourselves like swimming against the current and let the current carry us. The Hun rulers were also interested in immortality. In connection with Taoism, there is a close relationship between the humans and nature, which can be absorbed into folk practices for a search for immortality. The immortal life on earth could be achieved through diet and exercise, among other things. Confucianism centered on the human world. It was a rational political philosophy emphasizing propriety, difference, duty, and self-discipline. The Han Dynasty adopted this with a reverence for ancestors, correct relationships, and respect for authority. Emperor Wudi would infuse Confucianism with Chinese cosmology, where the emperor ruled by mandate of heaven. The moral system also equaled universal order. The Northern Way was the most enduring and powerful of the Northern Chinese dynasties that ruled before the reunification of China under the Sui and Tang dynasties. Buddhism, born in India, was transmitted to China. Starting as early as the first century CE, Buddhism brought to China new images, text, ideas about life and death, and new opportunities to assert authority. Under the Tang emperors, China's armies marched across Central Asia, prompting an influx of foreign peoples, wealth, and ideas into China. Also considered the age of international Buddhism. Barakana represents the primordial Buddha, who generates and presides over all the Buddhas of the infinite universe that form Buddhist cosmology. Buddha is assisted by two bodhisattvas and two disciples. The bodhisattvas are enlightened beings who have put off entering paradise in order to help others attain enlightenment. There were approximately 110,000 Buddha stone statues located along the Longman Caves. Buddhas on the cliffside, Longman Grottoes. This is the Yihe River. It runs through the suburbs of the ancient capital of Luoyang. The Longman Grottoes are one of the three largest grotto sites in China. The large Buddha statue inside this cave was carved in the 7th century during the Tang Dynasty. More than 100,000 Buddhist statues were carved here over a 400-year period. The oldest cave dates back to the year 494 at the time of the Northern Wei Dynasty. Inscriptions on the wall around each Buddha statue explain why it was carved. During the early period, they were mainly carved for individuals. Then state carvings began. This seated Buddha statue was commissioned by Xuan Wu, the seventh emperor of the Northern Wei dynasty. The statue was made to resemble his father, Xiao Wen. 
Buddhism was a national religion of the Northern Wei dynasty and its emperor was regarded as a reincarnation of Buddha. Hardly any new grottos were made after the fall of the dynasty in the middle of the 6th century. Grotto construction resumed during the Tang dynasty. Feng Xianxi Cave was built in 675 on the order of Gao Zong, the third emperor of the Tang dynasty. The Vairokana Buddha statue in the main hall is 17 meters high. It's believed the statue was built with a donation from the Empress Wu Zetian. There are statues of the Bodhisattva, Buddhist disciples and other Vairodhara images around the central Vairokana figure. They are regarded as the great masterpieces of Buddhist art during the Tang dynasty. About 60% of the grottos were made during the Tang period. One Fo cave contains thousands of carved Buddha statues. Some are less than 10 centimeters high. The Longmen grottos were at their height during construction of this cave. It had remained hidden for 1500 years before it was discovered during the 20th century. It was sadly looted shortly afterwards. Dilapidation at the site has become an important issue in recent years. Water comes out from cracks because of faults in the mountain rock. Restoration work is constant, but the material used for repairs soon decays. This is creating a new set of problems. A conservation project is underway with the collaborative support of China, Japan and UNESCO. During the Song Dynasty, invasions were made by outsiders known as barbarians. A definition of what it means to be Chinese was also developed during this time. The outsiders conquered all of the Eastern world under Genghis Khan, who led nomads from steppes north of China, known as the Mongol invasion. They conquered all of China, India, South Asia, the Middle East, and all the way to Eastern Europe. The Mongol Empire was the largest empire the world had ever known. The scholarly class was known as the literati. Thanks to Confucianism, these literati believed they should fulfill their obligation to the world, but also following Taoism, they would retreat from society to nature to better understand the universe. The scholarly trio of production was calligraphy, poetry, and painting. This was related to social status being the imperial status of court. The belief is that professionals are tainted by money and desire to please others which makes less important genuine artistic expression. All these ideas were brought together in a new form known as Neo-Confucianism. In this hanging scroll titled Travelers Among Mountains and Streams, we see an example of Neo-Confucianist ideas represented specifically in the landscape, which was the most esteemed subject. Symbolism can be seen in landscapes. What we do not see are religious figures or the supernatural realm. This is a new ideal that Khan carefully represented with the study of trees, rock formations, birds, insects, and other objects. He is trying to capture the essence of the mountain, the mountainness, and not a specific mountain. This also relates to the artist's self-cultivation to realize the perfect ideal. The monumentality is emphasized with the seven foot tall scroll. We move from foreground to background progressively. The foreground is shown at the bottom with the rock formation. After we have the middle ground with the travelers. Finally, we have a mountain in the last two thirds of the composition. This is similar to the Western tradition of landscape when personal experience with nature, which is understood to be God's creation, 
led to a deeper understanding of the divine and God himself. The feeling of climbing a high mountain is like leaving the human world behind where the humans are below us. The Taoist ideal is also represented here where nature is uninterrupted by humans. The Yuang dynasty was founded by the grandson of Genghis. On May 13, 1351, two vases and an incense burner were dedicated by a man who had them made for this purpose and had his name, date, and purpose of the dedication inscribed on the vases themselves. This was an offering to a general who had recently been made a god. These vases are among the most important examples of blue and white porcelain in existence and are probably the best known porcelain vases in the world. The founder of the Ming Dynasty was from a poor, uneducated peasant class who rose through the army helped by the literati scholars. Once Mongols conquered all of the Eastern world under Genghis Khan, the emperor began to distrust intellectuals and enforced a tyrannical type of rule. years the Forbidden City was the home of China's emperors and off-limits to anyone outside of the imperial court. Built in the 15th century at the heart of the ancient walled city of Beijing, the massive palace complex was the political heart of China during the Ming and Qing dynasties. Spanning an enormous 178 acres and boasting more than 9,000 rooms, it's the largest and best preserved collection of ancient buildings in China. The Supreme Harmony Gate overlooks a massive courtyard where audiences of up to 100,000 people gather for imperial ceremonies. Beyond the gate, in the heart of the Forbidden City, lies the most important building, the Hall of Supreme Harmony. During the Qing Dynasty, emperors held birthdays, weddings, and coronations here, making it not only the largest building, but also the most sacred. Made from glazed tiles and marble, the impressive Nine Dragon Screen was commissioned by the Emperor Tianlong in the 18th century. The fifth yellow dragon at its center symbolizes the emperor as the imperial power on the dragon throne, situated midway between heaven and earth. Let's talk about the Forbidden City, in which the third Ming emperor rebuilt as we see it today. The city was surrounded by moats and towers, making it easily defensible. Modeled on Southeast Asian temples, like one of Angkor Wat, which is also surrounded by moats and accessible by one bridge. You enter through the Meridian Gate, there is a horseshoe shape that transforms us from the Chinese commons in the south, lower section of the city, to the interior, which is guarded by a moat where the Mongols are located. It has perpendicular side wings that make it easily defensible and raised above a platform. The courtyard was crossed by a bow-shaped waterway spanned by five arched marble bridges. The number five in China connected with the balance of the various elements in nature. The next section 
one enters, we'll move them progressively to higher ranking officials. We see lions, which are a symbol of royalty. The emperor sat on his throne facing south. He is overlooking everything that is below him, which also represents the structure of the universe and heaven. Symbolically, the throne shows us the emperor who is the son of heaven looking down on the earth. 